This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our viewers and listeners across the country and around the world. Democrats have seized control of the House of Representatives, flipping more than two dozen seats. This gives Democrats subpoena power for the first time since President Trump was elected two years ago. While the Democrats will control the House, the Republicans picked up two more seats in the Senate. On the state level, Democrats picked up seven governorships. Huge turnout numbers were reported across the country. President Trump responded to the election results by tweeting, quote, if the Democrats think they are going to waste taxpayer money investigating us at the House level, then we will likewise be forced to consider investigating them for all of the leaks of classified information and much else at the Senate level. Two can play that game. The midterms were a groundbreaking election for women. For the first time in U.S. history, at least 100 women will serve in the U.S. House of Representatives, including the first two Native Americans. American women and the first two Muslim women. Later in the program, we'll hear from Democratic Socialist Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who became the youngest woman ever elected to Congress. But we begin today's show with two guests here in New York, Katrina Vanden Heuvel, editor and publisher of The Nation, America's oldest weekly magazine. She's also a columnist for The Washington Post.com. And we're joined by Rashad Robinson, executive director of Color of Change. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Let's begin with Katrina. Katrina Vanden Heuvel, your thoughts on what has taken place, the House now in the hands of Democrats. Republicans have expanded control of the Senate. I think taking back the House is critical as a check on President Trump. But also, I think it's important people know that uh, a majority of the committees and subcommittees will be controlled by progressives. The Progressive Caucus will have about 90 members. Some of the women you mentioned will join. Um, and it will have 13 committees and I think 30 subcommittees. That's important. And I think the ability to not only hold the president and the administration accountable on corruption, on self-interest, on self-dealing, but the ability to lay out bold initiatives, bold legislation may not pass with the Senate, as we've seen it, but it's critical, I think, that the progressive Democrats lay out in this war of ideas that progressives have been winning to a certain extent, 15 minimum wage, a jobs program, infrastructure, free higher ed. The governor's race, as Juan spoke of, critical. Critical both as a blue wall against the redistricting scams that we've seen from the Republicans, critical also to wrest back the Rust Belt from Trump, who really did well in key parts. Uh, Wisconsin, how sweet it is. Scott Walker going down. I mean, my colleague John Nichols has written so much copy about this man who busted public workers, assault on education, has demeaned and degraded the Wisconsin idea. So I think that's critical. Amendment 4, Rashad Robinson and I were talking about it. One thing we've seen in this election, Amy and Juan, the barriers to Democratic participation, the well-funded targeting voting suppression. So the Amendment 4, restoring rights to ex-felons to vote, 1.4 million Floridians will be able to vote, I think is a vital step on the road to a true democracy. State houses, we haven't seen the numbers yet, but those will be hopeful as well, flipping, I think, Minnesota and a few others. Um, so I think it was, you know, it, it, it's a bittersweet night because we've seen the incendiary, toxic nationalism, xenophobia, any immigrant actions talk of this president and his enablers in the Republican Party. You know, they, they secured some wins. However, those who say it was kind of split, let's all recall that this Senate map is the most horrific for Democrats. I mean, it's just, you know, the, the one-third up were really states in which the Republicans and Trump have uh, played well. So. Katrina, you mentioned the Rust Belt, and uh, well, I think it's important to note that there were three states yeah. that really delivered for, uh, Trump. for Trump: Wisconsin, Michigan, and, and Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. And of the uh, and there, in those three in those three states, the statewide uh, runs either for governor or for Senate for the U.S. Senate, uh, the Democrats won. I think six out of seven. So you're seeing a situation now where those key states now are really not and as uh, not as reliable. Republican, as they appear to be in 2016. And as you know, Juan, I mean, many of those voters went for Obama in 2008 and 2012. So it was that flip in 2016 uh, that has to be looked at. And I think last night was a good insight into what is possible in 2020. 
In effect, we can talk about it. 2020 began last night, but that's a different discussion. But I think you see it um, with taking back those those state houses. There were some good minimum wage initiatives in states. Very troubling that that good initiative in Washington state, the kind of carbon tax, the Green New Deal, went down. You still see the power of um, corporate money in and, our system. And at the state level, I think there were six states that moved into total Democratic control. Right, the flip. Right? And, and the, one of them being New York State, where the New York State Senate, which was had been very evenly divided with the Republicans controlled, now is overwhelmingly Democratic. No, 40 I think, to 23, I think, is now the number in the New York State Senate. And, what that means in terms of what can be accomplished by progressives in New York. And, and well, you, Democrats you, and progressives won a supermajority in the Vermont House, right. neutralizing uh, the newly reelected governor, Phil Scott's veto threats. No, this is critical. I mean, it's critical on so many levels, but historically, as you well know, we've lost over a thousand state uh, legislative seats in the last few years. So this is coming back and saying Democrats, progressives are going to play at all levels. New York State, you've studied, you've written one. It's a major win. Let us see what Governor Cuomo does with it, because he's hid behind the inability to do much with the independent Democratic conference now defeated. One last race, which I think is very important, Juan and I were talking about, is Antonio Delgado in the 19th congressional district. That race was supercharged with toxic racist rhetoric. John Faso has held out against good people like Zephyr Teachout, but he's gone. So um, I think, you know, it's a bittersweet, but I think real gains were made, and I think it would be wrong to downplay those. Um, one of the nation's most closely watched races of the year remains too close to call. Georgia Secretary of State Brian Kemp holding a slim lead over Democratic challenger Stacey Abrams, who is vying to be the first African American woman governor in U.S. history. But Abrams is refusing to concede because thousands of absentee ballots have not yet been counted. Kemp is currently at 50.5 percent. If he dips below 50, the race goes to a runoff. Uh, the Georgia race was marred by widespread allegations of voter suppression carried out by Brian Kemp, again, who is, the, as Georgia Secretary of State, is in control of the elections, despite the fact many demanded that he recuse himself. Meanwhile, in Florida, Democrat Andrew Gillum conceded to Republican Ron DeSantis after a tight race, Gillum attempting to become Florida's first African-American government, but faced a string of racist attacks from outside groups in DeSantis, who told Floridians not to monkey this up. And in Maryland, Republican Governor Larry Hogan was reelected, defeating Democrat Ben Jealous, the former head of the NAACP. Rashad Robinson, you're the executive director of Color of Change. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think these, um, you know, what happened last night with, um, particularly with Andrew and Stacey's race, I think represents the way that the South is changing. Um, these are candidates um, who came out of democratic, progressive infrastructure and were able to win primaries um, where they were not the establishment choice. And they, um, and not only did they win their primaries, but they showcased um, what the next generation can actually look like on the national stage um, through their debates, um, through their campaigns, attracting wide range of donors, attracting wide range of support. And, and in both places, you know, um, you know, we're not sure what's going to happen yet with Stacey's race, but four years ago, we have to remember that Jimmy Carter's grandson was at the top of the ticket and did not get as close as Stacey Abrams. There has never been a black woman governor um, in the United States. And so we've always known that there was going to be a, a high hurdle to get there, especially in a state like Georgia. And so I do think that um, the, the, the message that the Democrats should be taking away from this um, for 2020 and beyond is that we do have to speak directly to our base, that we do have to excite people with the type of passion and energy about what we can achieve, because Trump is going to mobilize his base. And if we are not working um, in the space of ideas and also trying to build um, power um, down ballot. I think that some of the other victories um, that happened uh, last night, the secretary of state victories in M Michigan and Wisconsin, yes, the governor victories are important, but being able to um, have um, those positions as we head into 2020 is going to be incredibly important. And, you know, and we've been looking very closely at a much larger secretary of state, mm -hmm. state strategy at Color of Change. We've been working um, diligently over the last couple of years to really focus more 
more attention on district attorney races, and saw some real victories last night, some of which happened in the primaries, with, um, you know, winning that victory in St. Louis um, in the aftermath of the Ferguson uprisings, but also, last night, a victory in Dallas, where there's been so much attention around policing and police shootings, and being able to go in and, and actually win that victory in Dallas, led by local organizers, the Texas Organizing Project, and others. So I think that, you know, this um, what what this means for um, a party that I think has oftentimes struggled with um, having um, a base that is deeply diverse with actually addressing the issues directly that that base needs them to address for folks to feel the type of passion and energy to turn out in high numbers. I, I hope that with this new wave of women, women of color, um, coming into office, that um, there will be some leadership changes at the top. And, and Rash there, yes. Rashad, I wanted to ask you, in terms of you, you, you mentioned uh, Texas and, and, and Georgia, these are states that have been reliably red for decades. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you're seeing a situation where there's better O'Rourke or whether uh, it's, uh, the, it's the, the race in, uh, in uh, Georgia, that now the prog progressive Democrats are really coming close. So that's showing you that Texas is no longer as reliably red, nor, mm -hmm. uh, nor is Georgia. And also Florida, this may be the last time it's a swing state because of, of uh, Amendment 4. Amendment 4, which is so exciting. You know, it just kind of debunks a lot of what the political class, some of the uh, consultants will tell you about what it takes to win those type of seats. Oftentimes, what they'll say is they, they need to find that sort of middle-of-the-road candidate, um, someone that maybe has come from the military or has the right last name. Maybe their parents or grandparents had won. And, and that is the sort of pathway to sort of taking back um, these sort of tough to reach places. But I do think that um, what Stacey, what Andrew, um, what O'Rourke have dis demonstrated is that um, mobilizing a base in, a, in, a, um, in states and in places where the demographics are rapidly changing um, is our best best path to power and is our, also our best path to actually delivering real results for folks. Because elections are not about getting people jobs or moving people up a ladder. They're actually about delivering for folks. And in 2016, a lot of what we heard from our members and from the members, our member volunteers who were out talking to folks, is that people were just disenchanted with the political process. Yeah, yeah. And this time around, the number of volunteers, the number of excitement, because there was actually candidates willing to speak clearly clearly and directly, and the fact that we are so close um, in Georgia and we are and we were so close into winning in Florida um, does send a real clear message about what's possible. You know, a lot is being made <clears throat> a lot is being made of the record number of people yeah. who came out, 113 million people in these midterm elections compared to something like 83.3 million in 2014. But still that is a half the population, the voting age population, did not vote.